year for us. For us, we saw general turned out at the beginning of February of this year to what Civil 2017 numbers are. Um, so, any questions on that? Any questions about that? All right, so we're going to cover the six trends they laid out. Um, these trends are broken into short term impact trends. Oh, thank you. Trends, uh, trends for the next year to two years. Um, that are helping to accelerate technology adoption in higher education. Then the mid-range, mid-term trends that are for, in for uh, three to five years in accelerating technology adoption in higher ed. And then the longer-term trends are five or more years, uh, things that are on educators' minds now, and they expect to be on educators' minds for a long time in the next several years. Uh, then we'll be going into six challenges, two solvable challenges we're both in, that we understand now these are the challenges that we understand, but uh, we require some extra time to understand so we can do better research. And uh, then two wicked challenges. And these two are really wicked challenges in terms of the research being able to be brought in and what we propose to add as we move through these, these tough challenges. Um, and those are ones that are hard to find, uh, let alone actually come up with solutions for. So we will hard try and come up with our own ideas, I should say. And hopefully, you'll all come up with solutions for something that's necessary we're going to do is go through uh, six important developments <coughs> in the EdTech um, adoption in higher ed. And so uh, two of those are either happening now or looking towards the later in the year. Uh, two are midterm, so two to three years. And the last two are longer term ones, so we expect to be seeing those within four to five years in higher ed. And these aren't necessarily law school, these are higher ed throughout. So we'll be talking about how these are applicable in legal ed. All right. Oh, now I have a fancy in my. All right, and hopefully they've got that working now. Um, and always challenges getting AV to work, but that's universal. And not, I know they're working really hard. So it's a wicked <laughs> challenge. Can you dance the slide? Yep. Great. All right, so I always said we talked about long-term impact trends, and it definitely innovation is one of them. Now, who's sick of hearing the word innovation? Because it's like suddenly it seems to have like less meaning, right? Like, oh, let's just be innovative and we'll come up with these ideas and then do nothing with them. But in terms of this report, and they actually want to be a little more active. So here they're saying, all right, innovation is um, not just coming up with new ideas, but then translating them to action uh, to solve specific problems or seize new opportunities. So the idea here is to uh, think of innovative concepts that students and faculty can work together to address and use the educational process to actually come up with concrete results. There's an idea that maybe 25% like of students who go into education in general want to be entrepreneurs. They want to you know, be in charge of their own business. So being able to be innovative or figure out where innovative fix within the business landscape is going to be important to them. It's been important for a while and it's going to be continue to be important in the, in the future as the economy changes. So we've seen many different kinds of programs. This is one example from IIT, the WISER program. It's got 60 faculty members that are involved in sustainability research. These faculty, you know, IIT has a technical part, so some of the faculty members are working on concrete solutions uh, with their students to uh, come up with sustainable programs and sustainable products. The law school is also involved. The two faculty members involved are experts in property and environmental law. And within the program, there's opportunities for those who are interested to take law classes that would help them understand the legal framework in which uh, sustainability research and sustainability products exist. So those are the kinds of programs that we'll see more in the future interdisciplinary and ones that allow students to look at the real world and come up with um, actual solutions that then they can take out when they are looking to be employed. So, but coming up with these, making them work, making them work successfully, that is going to be both a trend and a challenge that we're going to be seeing, I think, over the next many few years. Um, also in law, it's particular. We've seen people use all kinds of new technologies to um, create innovative products with their students. So who here has seen people work with Niata? What have you seen? Right, Iron Tech competition uses Niata. It's an expert systems uh, 
application that allows students to create something that then might be walk um, a client through a particular problem. Um, at Chicago Kent, I, we're, uh, people are working with quantitative analysis, so they use the open source R program. That's one of the data analysis programs like SPSS or STATA. So they're learning high-end programs like that, or they're working with programs like Kcura to work with document uh, creation and automation, again, to create actual products that can be used in a business setting. So the next long-term trend, um, accelerating technology adoption in higher ed, I'll just move this okay. up. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um, is rethinking how higher ed institutions work. And this is something that's been on, on our, our minds a lot. It's been on the minds of higher ed educators throughout all disciplines uh, for some time. And it's something that's going to remain on our minds for many, many more years to come. And the big focus in other fields, and certainly in ours, is preparing practice-ready graduates. And so in other fields, it's considered preparing career-ready graduates. And we've been getting a lot of pressure in legal education from legal employers to make sure that our graduates are practice-ready, more or less ready to hit the ground running uh, when they start or as soon as possible after they start. And in other areas of higher ed, the way this is being done is through focusing on experiential learning opportunities. This is one area where legal ed has a lot of advantage through clinical education, through skills courses. We've already had a strong focus in experiential learning in legal ed, and it's something that pretty much every law school is putting even more emphasis on in the last several years and for many more years to come. So this is one area where legal ed is strong. What are <coughs> other areas doing to rethink how they are uh, providing education in higher ed? And so in other higher ed degree programs, what they're doing is changing the focus of just graduating students who have these degrees to instead think of a students as lifelong learners and think of what they provide, the education they provide, as a service. So looking at education as a service, um, the idea with a lifelong learner is that you have a student come to you for an undergraduate degree, and then maybe they'll stay in your institution for a graduate program. And then they'll come back to your institution for continuing professional education. So this student is going to be a part of your community um, in various capacities as they move through their career. And they'll be a lifelong learner for you. So how are they approaching this education as a service structure? What they're doing is unbundling their degree programs uh, to have courses stand on their own, or even unbundling courses, to have them broken down into modules and to their, to their base components, where then they can then offer these modules, offer these unbundled courses to their students at the various stages they are in their career as lifelong learners. So how could we apply this in legal ed? Well, we're mostly focused on JD degree programs, of course, and for, some, for a lot of us, also LLMs. But we could break these down, unbundle them into, say, uh, the course components and offer them as certificates, which a lot of schools are starting to do or have been doing for a while for non-JDs. Um, and also allowing students in other programs, so students in, say, a journalism graduate school to take a First Amendment uh, law course at the law school, or students in an MBA program to take one or two business law courses while they're in their MBA program. So it's not just the curriculum is structured only to earn a degree, but the curriculum is an opportunity for students throughout the institution to get an education in the law. And the other thing is, if legal ed courses are modularized, where they're broken down into their components, then these modules can be offered slash sold uh, to graduates for continuing legal education. So if there's a graduate whose uh, practice, area is practice is expanding and they may need to learn a new area of the law, uh, they're not going to be able to go and take a single course necessarily, especially if that's during the workday. Um, but they may be able to do the module online for continuing legal education to learn that area of the law. And so now we're going to move into mid-term mid impact trends. Um, those, again, in the three or four year range. All right, so what's coming next? Um, redesigning learning spaces is, of course, something that a lot of us have been thinking about. And we're used to having classrooms that look kind of like this, where someone stands and talks to everybody, and there's not a lot of flexibility in the space itself. But as we are reconsidering different ways of providing learning to our students, not just in um, legal education, but all kinds of education, we're starting to see differences in how classrooms are designed. So some classrooms will have this look, and some classrooms will have 
a look a little bit more like this. So this is from Wake Forest. It's from one of their CS classrooms. They have modular tables. You can see they can be moved around. They have power everywhere, whiteboards everywhere. And the idea is you could set it up so that someone's standing at the top of the room talking or people are in different uh, spaces doing discussions and then maybe they'll come back together. It's a flexible room. It can handle a lot without a lot of, um, it doesn't look like this kind of room needed a lot of, it, of infrastructure. It looked like it could handle um, uh, everything fairly easily. There's not, you know, so many uh, different boards that people are running into cords or running into each other. And I've seen rooms here that it looks like they could be taken apart and put together in different ways. Chris, on your tour, you mentioned that you have those, even like those little portable whiteboards are ways that um, people can rearrange their space as needed. Uh, Jesse and Stefan at Northwestern, you have a classroom that has a space at the front of the room where people can speak and then uh, people can go to the breakout tables and either you can push the uh, information on the main screen to those individual tables or people can see what they need to on those spaces. So we are seeing law schools head towards, uh, when they can, of breaking away from a traditional room where people are at the front talking to the people at the back to rooms that offer, and spaces that offer a lot more flexibility, uh, particularly in the library. Um, even at IIT, our main campus library has a giant flexible room. Students like take bean bags and move them everywhere and whiteboards and move them everywhere. They love it. So we are getting away from the chairs and into a place where the design is what we want it to be. And so the next midterm trend is a shift to uh, deeper learning approaches. And in other areas of higher ed, there's been a renewed focus on critical thinking, on problem solving, and on collaboration. Uh, this is one development, one trend, where again, legal ed is at an advantage because critical thinking, problem solving, and collaboration have been components of legal ed for quite some time now. But there's more that can be done. Um, Problem-based learning can move outside of clinical education, can move outside of uh, skills courses, and move into doctrinal courses, move into all aspects of the curriculum, where um, not only are we doing things like developing client counseling skills in a clinic or in a legal skills course, but things like contract drafting can be included as a module within a contracts course, and some schools are doing this, or, um, or uh, memo, sorry, uh, motion drafting can be included in a civil procedure or criminal procedure course as a component where students can apply what they're learning as they're learning it to actually have a practical application and understand not just the doctrinal matter, but where it fits into their roles as a future practicing attorney. And now moving on to the short-term impact trends. Yeah, this is stuff we have to deal with right now. And it won't surprise you that one of them is learning analytics. I'm going to talk about learning analytics in general. Alex, you will talk about some specific tools later. And I know you guys recently had uh, the last session actually talk some about additional tools, but it's not something we can talk about enough. Um, we, you know, in legal ed, we're not used to thinking about this level of analysis, but not just the ABA has come up with the recent uh, changes in their rules, but the, those of a credit are home institutions, those of us who have them, we also have to be um, within the bounds of what they're asking for as well. Now, people are still doing more, or universities are still doing more institutional analytics than learning analytics, but learning analytics is catching up because it's becoming so important. But there are many, many questions that people have about learning analytics that not just law, everyone is struggling with. What do we analyze? What's going to get a result? Um, how do we do this analysis? We saw many different tools in the last session uh, that Will was moderating, and some of those tools provided feedback to the students, and some of them provided feedback to the faculty. Who needs to do that analysis is a good question. Student privacy is of paramount concern, and uh, some of these analytic tools sometimes provide too much information to, say, the vendors, and a lot of universities are very concerned with this. And the feedback still has to be useful to the faculty and to the students. So the report talks about continuous feedback to the students, but I can see something like that making our law students very nervous. They want more feedback than they get now, but I don't know how they would take continuous feedback. So something that we'll want to consider over time. 
Um, we also have a culture where tests are done a particular way and have been done a particular way since the beginning of time, or at least the beginning of Langdellian education. Sometimes we'll see some multiple choice questions, but generally it is a test that's graded on a curve. And we are seeing more faculty make use of things like midterms or um, polling or other kinds of assessments throughout the class. But there is going to have to be a big culture change, as we all know, to get the faculty on board with doing different kinds of assessment and maybe assessment that's not quite within their control. And that's going to be a bit of a paradigm shift for them. But but we've got to address it now because that's what the ABA has asked us to do and that's what our other creditors have asked us to do and hopefully we can come up with some solutions that make sense and work for everyone, most particularly of course our students. Right. And the last of these trends, the, the next short term trend that's definitely on a lot of people's minds in higher ed and also in legal ed is blended learning. And so. By blended learning, it's the concept of including in-classroom and out-of-classroom components. The out-of-classroom components are ordinarily digitized and online. Uh, many of you here in this room have heard me talk about flipped classrooms uh, for the last couple Cali conferences. And now we're also moving into uh, higher adoption of hybrid courses or fully online courses. I am teaching a hybrid legal research course this summer to our part-time students um, at CUNY. And let me ask you all, while you're here, um, how many of your institutions are doing either flipped or hybrid or fully online course? Actually, let me break those down. Flipped. Great. Hybrid. Any fully online? Awesome. All right. So this is something that, um, again, is a trend pressing right now. Um, and it's something that on a lot of people's minds. So I talk a lot about the classroom, talk a lot about blended learning. And I ask people who are trying this or doing this, What's needed? What do faculty need to do this? Since it's something that's on a lot of people's minds. And the number one thing I hear is support. Uh, faculty need either having you know, someone to help them with instructional design or uh, learning technology tools, hardware tools, uh, software tools, and also uh, may need help in actually creating the content. So not just being trained on how to use the tools, but having people work with them side by side in the content creation process. Uh, at CUNY, because we don't have an instructional designer, uh, we don't have an educational technologist on staff, I'm the closest thing that we have to one, um, and it's just a component of my job, really, is um, we think in an approach of having faculty support one another in their educational te technology adoption. And so right now, there's a team of eight faculty, I'm included in that, who are developing hybrid courses. Um, the one I developed uh, was for the summer. There are a few being developed for the fall and for next spring. And really, through our different knowledge in different areas, I'm not as strong as in instructional design as I am in tech. I'm learning from a faculty member who's very strong in instructional design on developing my course. And we're all sharing what we know and supporting each other in doing this. And it's a model that has worked really well for us, um, given that we don't have other resources available. So we're supporting one another. But really, the absence of support is what I think is a big barrier for faculty moving in this direction. All right, so those are the, the six pairings of trends, the long-term, mid-term, and short-term trends that are accelerating uh, technology adoption in higher ed. And we wonder if folks had any questions about those trends. You guys all seeing these same ideas in your universities and their causes, and we have a lot of questions about it. Yep. It's interesting, I guess, more to comment, but with, um, with the structure of the classrooms, you're talking about the modular tables and Mm -hmm. The issue that I'm running into is that with, with online courses, people think these courses from everywhere. Right. So we're putting a disclaimer that says, please, please don't do this from Starbucks, or please, please don't do this on the train. But I guess my question is, how is the impact of on what's the impact of online classes to this building a classroom? learning environment idea. So what's the impact of online classes, particularly where the technology can be very different to uh, online, and that's, I mean, obviously it's going to be one of the big challenges. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in terms of devices, but what are you seeing as a, someone who's currently teaching where you could be seeing people come with almost anything or from anywhere? Sure. Um, I think the so you're, you're hitting on two of these trends, right? The, the classroom environment and also online education. 
Um, I think the best way to address that is to keep those two things separate. So um, the online component, let's just say in hybrid course development, right? The online component is designed to um, convey information to students, to convey knowledge and have them through formative assessments or possibly submit assessments, I'll talk a little bit about my hybrid later on, um, show their understanding of the material, right? Where these new classroom designs that are sort of like classroom pods are really built around the idea of collaboration. And so using the classroom time for face-to-face -face collaboration, working on projects, um, or developing things in teams, I think is the best way to think about it. Maximizing the design of the classroom for what you want to accomplish while you have the instructor there in the room with the students, and maximizing your online design for what you want to accomplish, having students understand the material through the out-of-classroom component. Does that address your question? That, that, I mean, that works for me in my head for the hybrid part of it. Yeah. Because if you've got that time you know, with the students one-on-one -on -one in that classroom, I understand that. But you have fully online courses well, that you're fully online, okay. I mean, if, if the trend is going to be to build learning spaces that are helpful to students, how do we translate that to those fully online classes? So how do we translate the physical to the fully online? Um, and has anyone tried to do anything with that? Because that's, a, again, particularly a challenge. That's a challenge with the um, people doing online for a long time because they try to, to translate things like the student experience. Do they have access to clubs? Do they have access to uh, the same library resources? Do they have access to uh, the same level of help desk support? Not to mention, um, you know, if someone was in that space, would they be able to see what's on the whiteboards if they were a part of the online component for the class? Rich? I was involved in one hybrid course where there was a face-to-face -face class with uh, three students that come in remotely. And there were some etiquette issues that needed to be addressed because one of the people who was online, a couple of times she came from her daughter, using her phone from her daughter's swim class. <laughs> so. And you know what, a swimming pool is like, it's big echoey, like it was, we had to mute her literally because it was just overwhelming the whole room with the audio coming. We eventually worked it out. There are some new norms and, uh, and yeah, so some of this is being solved through etiquette and uh, you might hear this uh, this has definitely come up on the, the law uh, group that talks about distance education. Etiquette is a big part of that. One more question? So group projects is another solution. Yeah. All right, let's move on. All right. And so we're going to move into the challenges. Again, these are challenges that are impeding technology adoption in higher ed. Um, the solvable ones, we understand them, and we know how to solve them. The difficult ones, we understand them, but we're not quite sure how to approach solving them. And then the wicked ones that we have a hard time defining, let alone figuring out how they could possibly be solved. <laughs> and so the solvable challenges, First one. So the first one is not just about technology, but sort of how education fits in with everything in general. There's a lot of different types of learning that takes place in different types of places. Some of this has a technology component, some does not. One of the things uh, that's addressed both in the report, and I, I believe the, um, the uh, keynote speaker addressed today, and this most ways talked about, but he, I believe, mentioned that there is a lot of learning that takes place outside of academia, let's say in people's work. So if you've got someone who is a non-traditional student, they've come in, they're not going to think of themselves as a novice. They're going to already have a lot of experience. For example, in my last presentation, I mentioned that one of the people in the legal writing class I was working with was a 19-year uh, vet paralegal. So what's he going to know about legal research that we're going to teach him. He already knows all this stuff, but yet he's in the same kind of class. So how do we address that kind of uh, experience that people get in such a way that makes sense, is fair, and is, can be quantified? And that's going to be one challenge as we get different kinds of workers coming in and out of academia, both in law schools and in other aspects. The other thing is, is one solution might be to use what uh, the report calls micro-credentials or nano-degrees. Now, I can't imagine going up to my faculty and saying, let's offer a nano-degree in legal research. But the idea is to say, let's acknowledge the different kinds of skills that people have and find some way to say that they're, they've accomplished this. They've got a credential. We can test it. We can show that they have this skill or this background. 
Um, in law schools, I've seen some people at least discuss badging. Um, has anyone tried using a badging for some of their um, more uh, base skills, like maybe a certain tech skill set or legal research or writing skill set? I know there's a lot of talk about it, but I haven't seen a lot of it. So a lot, I've seen this particularly in the library space, a lot of librarians have considered badging to say, okay, you know, you've got a certificate that says you've completed this set of modules, but some libraries have been said, you know, we've got a badge, you've got a badge in legislative history, and you've got a badge in, you know, regulatory research. Um, and other universities have done this, but it doesn't, hasn't gotten a lot of credibility within the law school space yet. But that's something we're going to have to consider, particularly as we start working with non-traditional students, uh, and maybe even you're going to talk about using, talking with, working with non-JD students, they may be looking for this kind of credential. The other kind of informal learning the report address, and this is where technology starts to come in a little more strongly, is the concept of a lot of learning taking place was within discussion. You know, we talk about Socratic method, someone stands here, we talk to a uh, student, but then we're seeing more uh, law faculty also use informal discussions as part of their um, pedagogical tool set. So uh, some of the discussions will look like this, they'll take place in class, maybe one of those great modular classrooms, but other discussions will take place online, some within formal LMSs where they can be tracked, but we've got other discussions that might take place on Facebook. So we've got a faculty member who uses a Facebook discussion group so that his students can ask questions at any time. Uh, Rich, you also brought up in your uh, session uh, an example of not in law school but in a different educational setting where students felt they weren't getting the education they needed from the faculty member in charge, so they started meeting informally, uh, and I believe they used face-to-face -face and online um, tools to do this in order to get the information they needed to succeed in the class. So it's not just where things are being assigned by a faculty member and discussions taking place, but sometimes it's students working with themselves or even law school what we know some of the oldest ways that we've learned are our group study uh, group our study groups that we work to prepare outlines lots of informal learning taking place there not really a great way to capture it not really a great way to assess it so um, that's going to be one of those challenges going forward all right so our next solvable challenge is improving digital literacy now there's this presumption that all our digital natives uh, coming to our schools, and not to assume that every student is a digital native, but um, there's this presumption that the digital natives are, are um, just adept at using every single technology tool that's presented to them. And that is a false presumption. It is without a doubt a myth. So of course students are comfortable using the tools that they use every day, whatever apps are on their um, smartphones, that kind of thing. But when they're introduced to a new learning management system, when they're introduced to a new, say, video annotation system that they may have to use in a clinic, or when they're introduced to law practice technologies, um, they, need, they may need as much training to get uh, a strong foundation in how to use these tools as anyone else who is not a digital native would need. And so we have to break this idea of assuming that our students as digital natives can just use these things, pick them up right away, um, and also help them develop the digital literacy skills they need to be able to use the kind of tools they'll need for practice. So how can we address this in law school? Well, the first thing as a librarian I'll say is that us librarians have been thinking a lot about digital information literacy and make a point of uh, training our students to learn how to not only find information and use information, but how to evaluate the information that they find. To stop and take the time to think, all right, so I found this piece of information through a Google search. How valuable is this to my research? Um, can I trust this information? Should I find other sources of information? So training students to stop and think about that in the process of using information is really important. And um, I'm sure all the librarians in the room who teach are doing that right now. Another thing we can do is include law practice technologies throughout the entire curriculum. Because saving them for just a clinical education during the third year, um, we should take the opportunity to have our students from the very beginning of um, law school use these law practice technologies in, say, their writing course. So there's no reason why a practice management system, a case management system, can't be used in a legal writing course. And I know that some folks are using Clio in the legal writing course, which is fantastic. Um, and there are other uses for these tools throughout the curriculum. And the last thing that I think is really important in digital literacy 
in legal ed is to make sure that our students graduate knowing about uh, data privacy, knowing the importance of keeping all of their clients' information in a safe uh, way to access it through the cloud. And so data privacy is something that, data security and data privacy is something that we need to impress upon our students. At CUNY, we make sure that all of our students, when they're entering the clinical programs, uh, take a two-hour training on data privacy and data security, and it's something that we all need to do to make sure that our students are ready for practice and the kind of technology tools we'll be using in practice. All right, so next, the difficult challenges. We get this, but what are we gonna do with them? Um, so one of the surveys mentioned in the, uh, in the report said that 85% of the survey, uh, student surveyed, and you can see it's an international survey, um, looked at the digital uh, capabilities of the institution. They looked at classroom technology. They looked at integration. They looked at the online available learning options. And these were key determinants in their selection. Now, I don't know if we would get the same numbers out of law students, but remember, we are part of a group of we're competing with a group of all kinds of other educational opportunities. So if we want to reach the students who are looking for this kind of technological innovation, technological opportunity, we have to be aware that this is something they are highly interested in. So, um, and not just that, but there are other innovations that are taking place within academia that students are really responding well to. So not just Arizona, but it's one example. Arizona State University in their undergrad are offering edX courses that students can take for free. And this lets them try before they buy. They can see, hey, is this going to work out for me? Is this major going to work out for me? Is this school going to work out for me? Do I like how they use technology? Do I like they, how they teach? Do I like their philosophy? They get to try it on their own time. They don't have to worry about paying for it. Once they're done, they can transfer credits if they decide to enroll. So this is something that, again, it's available to it, uh, different other kinds of education that's available to the market we want to reach. I've heard people say, oh, well, maybe we can offer the first year for, um, and get, offer people refunds if they don't like it. That's not realistic. But maybe there's ways, maybe they could try a torts course or something over the summer, um, uh, or some kind of, even just go through some online lectures so our students can see what it is that law school's gonna be like, get an idea before they enroll. Because and as we all know, sometimes entering law school can be a complete surprise to some of our students and what's expected, how the vocabulary works, how things are taught. And if they can have that information before they join us or as they're considering where to apply, I think it would, the, would attract more law students in general to the field. Um, that says there's uh, also additional challenges with uh, these as well. If we have online classes, are employers going to buy into them? Or if we offer a, some alternative ways that uh, our students can participate, uh, will they be accepted by accreditors? So, you know, are, are these online degrees and certificates, are they going to be enough? And the report puts this under this area of the cha of challenges as well, because not only do we have to convince our students that we are going to provide excellent education, excellent opportunities for them, we have to convince the employers that what we are providing these students are going to be useful for the kinds of employees that they want to have in their institutions, in their offices, and in their companies. All right. And so for our next difficult challenge, we move into the area of personalizing learning, which is something that um, is on the minds of a lot of educators in other areas of higher ed and probably not on the mind of so many legal educators, but could be in time. Um, and the idea with personalized learning is that the focus is on making sure that students um, achieve competency in whatever areas that they need in order to earn the degree, in order to complete whatever um, the requirements are, the learning outcomes are for that program. And the way they achieve competency instead of just taking courses in a traditional semester structure is to have the students work at their own pace, to have the students set their own pace in how they approach the information, how they absorb the information, how they show their own understanding of the information through formative assessments, um, and then how they show their mastery of the information to the instructor through summative assessments. And so this is a very controversial idea um, in higher ed. I'm sure if uh, I tried to advocate for it, which I'm not saying I am doing, advocating for it, um, in legal ed, it'd be pretty controversial because it totally changes the way that education is structured. It's not about the student being in the classroom and moving at the same pace as everyone else, but rather the focus is on making sure the student understands before moving forward. 
And that's one flaw of a semester system or a traditional education system, is that everyone moves at the same pace, everyone's required to move at the same pace, whether they're actually understanding the material or not while they're moving. So how is this actually accomplished? Well, the approach is done a lot of different ways. I talked a little bit earlier about uh, modules, and so modules are pretty much the best way to approach it, where you take the competencies you want the students to learn, break those competencies down into modules, and then have students show their mastery of those different areas as they build and progress until they've shown their mastery of what would traditionally be contained in a course. And there's also differences in the approach, um, <coughs> adapting to the student's learning style. So traditionally we have students do some reading before class, they engage in a lecture in class, then they take a test, that, a written test, that shows their understanding of the material or potentially not their understanding of material. Uh, instead, the, the different approaches could also involve things like having students watch video lectures or watch videos that are multimedia interactive or engage in multimedia interactive tutorials that convey the information to them and let them show their understanding of information uh, into the system, to whatever software is being used. And also display their mastery of this through doing things like creating presentations versus just writing out a quiz or a test. Uh, or in my case, I accept for legal research final. For one component of it, I let my students record a video and walk me through their research process. They don't have to just write down bullet points, numbered order. If they want to record a video, they can. Um, last semester, one student created a Prezi, which she uses a mountain metaphor, and used the legal research process as climbing the mountain. And she laid out her entire um, legal research process through that Prezi, instead of just giving me a bullet, bulleted, numbered, ordered list. Um, or students could say if they had a short answer question, they could, instead of writing out the short answer, uh, they could just talk out the short answer, put it into a video, uh, send me a link to that video either in Dropbox or uh, YouTube or whatnot, and I could grade them based on that. I want to make sure that they've mastered the information. How they convey it doesn't matter so much to me as that they understand the information. So, yes? So when you say personalized, is it more like giving them different paths to choose? Like you can choose the video path, you can choose the more traditional path, etc. Because when I hear personalizing, I'm thinking I'm going to sit with each student and come with you know, a specific learning plan for all the students. Aside from that being very time intensive, um, I know that at least for law schools, I can't remember the, in New York, I can't remember the exact number of years, but you have to have a student graduate in the next number of years. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand someone's desire maybe to take one course a year for the next 10 years just because it's something that they're interested in. Sure. But we can't help them with that. Yeah, so the question is, um, a personalized, um, you know, does this mean that the student is self-directed and then, you know, what, when do you create any kind of markers where the student has to finish the material? And technically, the way this is done in other uh, areas is that students are expected to do it within, say, an academic year um, so that their pace isn't, like, super slow. Uh, but in legal education, I'm about to get into how it could work in legal education, so I think this next slide might help answer your, address your question at least. Um, to think about how this could work in legal education, and again, this is kind of a all safe, far-fetched idea, although I do think that the way it's laid out is, uh, is interesting. It's something that uh, Michelle Castone from Villanova Law um, laid out in a post on the Christensen Institute's website on how personalized learning could work in legal education. And so again, competency is what you're working towards and identifying very concrete learning outcomes and making sure that students have those clear learning outcomes and work through those um, and demonstrate mastery through assessments. So getting to your point about um, is, the is the instructor sitting with the student and walking through the student one by one? There'd be technology tools that would help the student understand the information, receive the information, convey their understanding information, and the instructor would receive um, the data set, you know, receive how the student did, get some feedback as the student's working through the series of modules so that it, all, it isn't only until the very end where the instructor has feedback on this, how the student's doing. Um, so those formative assessments would be very critical, not just your traditional 100% final uh, summative assessment. But how could that actually work? Um, students would be self-paced, um, and they'd have to show mastery in a certain module and then move on. And technology is really, is really important here, but the feedback is also very important. So it would take an entirely reconcept entire reconceptualization of how we teach in legal ed. To actually make this work, Rich, I sorry I missed your session, but I, I, I'm sure you folks addressed this in some way. What you were talking about just reminded me of something, and this wasn't in a legal setting, but it potentially could be used for an assignment that the instructor put together a rubric saying, if you want to get an A, this is what you need to do. If you're happy with a B, you know, do this, if you just want to slide by this, you do this. 
So you give some choice to the student that they really want to do well. And here's the standard you've got to meet. You just want to get your B mark or whatever that you is. Yeah, and rubrics are a great approach because my students actually, um, in this part-time class, because a lot of them uh, do work full-time, our parents um, are, expect are used to seeing their students, their children receive rubrics from their children's teachers, uh, have been asking me for rubrics. And I've been trying to develop rubrics whenever I can. Uh, I've been trying to get an approach to developing rubrics without giving away exactly what I want them to show in their mastery. So it's kind of tough. Um, but I think rubrics would be a good way for students to know what is it the instructor is looking for, what is going to get them an A versus a B versus just to coast through. Yeah, do you have a comment? I love that idea, but the problem is, I know in our school, um, going to the lab and teach a course and only allowed May the curve ever be in your favor. Yeah. So he's pointing out that in each course, they're only allowed to give a certain number of A's. But yeah, thanks for contributing that. All right, so now we move into, oh, sorry, is there another hand down there? Sorry. Only that we have a similar situation where I am, but uh, you can work around that. I mean, courses are exempt from the curve requirement if group work is involved, which is also a good thing. And so you can work to change that structure within your school, which is really helpful as you're moving forward to try other approaches. So in your school, if there's group work, then the curve doesn't. It only, oh, okay, so the curve's only advisory, so that's a big change for a law school. Yeah, but these policy changes um, are the kinds of things that are needed in order to move in these directions of adopting these different approaches. All right, on to the wicked. Yeah, on to the wicked. All right, and so the first wicked challenge is a wicked challenge that we all face in our daily lives. It's balancing our connected and our unconnected lives. Um, I'm sure that all of you would probably want to be a little less connected than you are right now, not having a mobile device in your pocket that 24 hours a day can get you online. Um, I see one person back there is like cheering the fact that she is not connected at the moment. Some of you are multiple connected right now. Um, and finding that balance is something that's important not only in our own personal lives, but in education, right? Um, we are, those of us who are educational technology enthusiasts often say there is no value in adopting technology for technology's sake. And we make sure that we convey that to instructors when they're doing that um, because it's important to not overwhelm students, let alone overwhelm faculty or staff with all these technology tools that really, are, really aren't having a transformational um, impact on how students are learning. And so this SAMR model for educational technology adoption is one good thing to keep in mind in trying to find that balance. To try and stay away from the top of the model, the S, the substitution, try and stay away from just technology tools that are substituting something that's already been done for a long period of time, like replacing a text with, replacing a casebook with an e-casebook. Um, it's really the same exact thing, uh, not really all that big of a change, but really instead of focus on the redefinition. So introducing um, new projects, new tasks, new ideas in the classroom that were previously inconceivable because the technology wasn't there to allow it to happen. So I have an example of that. And in CUNY's 1L lawyering seminar class, which is a mix of legal writing and also lawyering skills, uh, students have to do a, a client interview and client counseling exercise. And this is something that used to be video recorded and the instructor would provide feedback to the students after reviewing the videos. But what's being done now is that it's being video recorded. The instructor's providing feedback through a video annotation system software called Vocat that was developed at a different CUNY campus. And it's also being, um, feedback is also being given by peers. So everyone in the class is watching everyone else's client interview video once they're all done and providing feedback to their peers, which is great because they're not only getting one set of feedback, they're getting potentially 18 pieces of feedback from their peers as well. Um, this is something that could not have happened before VOCAD as a technology tool because to get all the students in the room at the same time to watch all of these client interviews happen at the same time or having them check out all these different videotapes or whatnot would be a real hassle, let alone providing the feedback where we have a tool now that in one simple place people can log on and watch two of these. They get tired of watching their, their classmates do client interviews, so they log off and do something else and then come back and do another couple and log off and do something else and they eventually will provide feedback for everyone in the classroom, which is really great. So that's an educational technology tool that's really having a transformational um, use in the classroom. What is that called? It's called VOCAT. And so there's other video annotation systems. Debbie was Panopto, Panopto does video does, annotation. Yeah, Panopto offers video annotation. Um, and uh, 
was it, Callie had a project for Media Notes, um, which was uh, oh, yeah. Windows software based versus a browser based software uh, application. But both have browser based, and I'm guessing Panopto, what they offer, is also browser based. It is. Yeah. yeah. Quick question How do you find the quality of the feedback that the students give? So the students are being, um, in the classroom, they're being told how to give feedback. Uh, so, which is also really great because it's, it's an additional um, practice skill that they weren't being taught before because giving feedback to one's peers is an important part of practice. And so learning that as one else is something that they weren't taught before because they didn't have had to give feedback to their peers. So it's one thing that's being incorporated right now as well. Yeah. I'm just going to say, if you're interested in the framework for feedback, mm -hmm. video, performance, So find Larry Farmer's Cali videos, and that will give us a good framework for feedback. Yes. Uh, there are people who are listening through Panopto. I see them tweeting, so. Oh, yes. Hello. Great. All right. All right. So yeah, this is the future of education, and we're just going to have everyone passively sit there and um, apparently crank books into their heads. Uh, I, I love this image, but there's still the idea of technology is somehow just going to make education completely relevant. Um, it's just going to get poured in, but of course, as we move towards more active learning, this is not quite where it's going. That said, we are seeing uh, this idea of, well, in a world of technology, how do we keep education relevant? Um, there's a lot that we are competing against. I've mentioned some of the different uh, tools and ideas that are being tried by other undergraduate and other master's degree programs, but there's even additional competition out there. We've talked about MOOCs. We're saying, oh, they're not relevant, but they still exist, and there's still places like Coursera where if I want to get certain credentials, I can pay them a few hundred versus a few thousand dollars and get those credentials. So I think Deb Quintel was talking to me about, like, for maybe $500, I can get credentials in project management. I've got similar credentials from Northwestern, and they were much more expensive than that. So um, that is one of the things we're competing against when we are uh, trying to figure out how to keep education, particularly legal education, relevant. The other thing is, and this has been a long discussion for many years, back to at least the 90s, if not long further ago, which is the balance between teaching doctrine versus teaching practical skills. And there's a fear that um, if we go this direction then uh, of practical skills, then law becomes more vocational. And there is a move towards vocational training. There's always the need for that, to do the practical day-to-day -day skills, not just in law, but in everything else. But there's also stigma attached to that, and people won't uh, they're worried that, that people won't come to educational institutions to get that training. Uh, and so lawyers are afraid that being perceived of just merely the drive-through lawyer, where um, they're not necessarily valued for their legal expertise. But then again, I can see the need for a drive-through lawyer. It would be great. It would serve a, an AI audience that's not currently served, but is our law, our law school set up for training this kind of lawyer in addition to the big firm lawyers, in addition to the public interest lawyers, government lawyers, people where uh, they're getting JD advantaged um, jobs and that's what they want. We have a, such a great um, variety of different jobs that we're trying to train for um, all through a system that still is very similar from school to school to school. I've heard some people here talk about Cali, about some amazing changes they're making in their school to address the particular local needs um, of their institutions, and that's great, but I think we're going to have to do more of that and not be afraid of the drive through lawyer, because look, the drive through lawyer gets Starbucks. Um, and be prepared for that education as we find our niche. And, and you know, uh, def many different faculty members, uh, such as Dan Katz at IIT, have talked, well, wait, let's not be afraid of finding our special place, our special place in the law school. We don't all have to compete with Harvard. We can be each our own institutions and serve our own constituencies. Um, but that's definitely a wicked challenge because there's a lot of change that would have to take place before that could happen. All right, so any questions about these six challenges, the solvable, the difficult, and the wicked? I know we're low on time, so I'm going to try and jump through my part of these um, right. important developments in ed tech for higher ed. Um, 
And yeah, so there were a lot of different things that they selected from. So if you disagree with the list, there was a larger list that they took from it. And the wiki has more information about all of this. All right, so on a horizon of right now to up to a year. One year less. All right, so I was surprised to see bring your own device on there because I think we've been all bringing our own devices for a long time. The issue here, of course, is how to incorporate the devices pedagogically. So we've seen people use different things like Socrative. Uh, I've seen, uh, in Richard, your survey, you said students were taking notes on their smartphones. And I think that's a great place to take notes because you can't tr transcribe on a smartphone. Hopefully they're not recording. But if they are actually using it, they think they're going to get some benefits of really thinking about what their, uh, what their notes are saying. Um, on the IT side, of course, bring your own device provides a lot of problems that everyone's trying to solve every day. Let's talk every single device we have on the network. That won't cause a security problem at all. But um, this is still a, it's so relevant and so prevalent every day that it was included in the report. And so to quote Rich uh, from his survey from a couple of years ago, 100% of the surveys that you, students you survey were bringing in smartphones to law school. It is ubiquitous. It is there. You, except for the one or two that might have a flip phone on a dare, you guys were saying, um, you can pretty much count on them having smartphones. All right. So the next um, when you're less, uh technology tools are those for learning analytics. And we talked a little bit about those um, using data that we can collect about our students to help our students shepherd through their learning, um, and also through adaptive learning. So this is building on the idea of personalized learning. Adaptive learning is the actual technology tools that you'd be using, the software you'd be using to offer these modules to students, to have students provide, um, to have students enter into formative assessments, get some data back from them on how they're understanding, have students have their instructor potentially um, become more involved and help them in the things they're having difficulties with, and then have their summative assessments available done online too. So this is how we would actually accomplish it if adaptive learning does happen in higher ed or legal ed. So how could we actually do these things in legal ed? The big challenge in legal ed is data points, right? We don't have that many data points on how our students are doing. If we have a 100% final exam, then we don't know until the very end whether our students are understanding it or not. So I traditionally had two data points in my class. I had a midterm and a final. And what I've done this semester with the hybrid is I've also included uh, five additional data points, five graded quizzes. And on top of that, there's seven formative assessments, seven sets of multiple choice questions that the students use for their own assessment of how they're understanding. So there's an addition of 12 other data points besides the midterm and the final. And I see these uh, formative assessments, so I see every single week as they're doing these review questions, how they're understanding the material, and then of course I grade their graded quizzes, and they just took their midterm last week, they've done three graded quizzes so far, and five of the multiple choice review question sets. So I already have a good amount of data on how my students are doing. And we have four classes left, and I'm going to be calling some students in this week to talk and see if, how I can help them do the best they can on their final, because up until now, the, the data has shown that they're a little behind the mean in the class. So what we need to do is have more data, which is a hard thing to ask instructors to do, a thing to ask, hard thing to ask professors to do. Um, and how could adaptive learning work in legal education? In traditional law school, it become kind of hard pressed with ideas for how to do it, but it's already being used in bar prep. So adaptive bar is using uh, is in a bar prep software for the multiple state bar exam, the multiple choice questions for the bar exam. And what it does is it begins with offering students um, a fair offering of the multiple choice questions. And as it learns what areas students are stronger in and weaker in, it provides fewer questions in the stronger areas and more questions in the weaker areas to help the students develop greater strength in those weaker areas. So it's adapting to how it's seeing students respond. All right, our two to three year horizon. Well, two to three year for other parts of education, not necessarily us. So does anyone know what HoloLens is from Microsoft? This is sort of a success for to Google Glass, but on steroids. It's a large uh, visor. It goes around your head, and you perceive the world like that. So that guy's playing Minecraft. Who here knows Minecraft? 
All right, so all of you guys have like seven to 10 year old children. This is sort of Legos in a computer and all children play it constantly all the time. Um, obviously, you're not gonna do that in legal education and it's not easy, even easy to see how something like that would be used in legal education except for two points. I'm not gonna play the video now because of time reasons, but this is an example of how HoloLens is being used in medical education where a uh, student can easily see everything, uh, a 3D model of a body. So again, a student who's looking for a high technology module of education might be attracted to medical school where lawyers, law does not have that. The other thing that we need to be aware of when it comes to things like the HoloLens is something that Emily Barney brought up in yesterday's session uh, when we were talking about Word, and that's visual literacy. Because it may be that we decide in the future we're going to develop something cool in HoloLens for a jury, but if we don't understand how the jury is going to perceive a 3D environment, then that's going to be um, a big problem. And so lawyers are going to have to understand not just how the technology works, if they want to incorporate this into their practice ever, um, and again, that's long on the horizon, they're gonna have to understand how others perceive it. So it's part of the whole visual literacy that I think that we need to be including as part of legal education. All right, and so the next um, ed tech tools on the horizon for higher ed in the two to three year range are maker spaces. So this is a complicated thing to extend into to law school because makerspaces deal with physical objects. And there really aren't that many physical objects we think about when we think about learning the law. Um, so most people think about 3D printers or maybe circuit boards and, and building other things. How could we actually expand this concept of makerspaces into law schools? There'll be a session at 4 o'clock talking about this. I have that coming up in the slide. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what they have to say about it. Uh, but some ideas, again, as I mentioned, the vocat video thing that we do at CUNY Law, we actually have a space dedicated for that. So we have a video recording room that is the vocat room, and it's nothing else but the vocat room. And so the video camera's set up, students know how to learn how to upload the files to the vocat system, it's all there for them. Um, and another thing we could do is have hackathons be a regular part of legal education, where we'd invite software developers into our law schools to work with our students on developing software applications that have a practical practice component or an access to justice component as part of our students' education and also part of the work that the uh, development students do. And just for everyone who might be interested in the makerspace presentation, that's at four o'clock um, in room 346. Okay, just a couple more things. Uh, here they say this is coming in education in four to five years. I think for legals is coming faster. And I'm gonna play the video just because it amuses me. Um, but the idea is, what can we do when we have stressed employees? This guy is super stressed. Um, and what's going on in this particular uh, video is these students are developing a way to test employee stress using feedback. So, we're saying stress is a problem, people get really stressed all the time, 50% of workers rely on moments of stress, and they're using, this is really loud, these little devices on their hands, sensors on their hands to measure, I don't want to go back through them again. Don't go back through him again. So there's sensors on their hands that are um, testing how stressed those employees are and then presumably can do something about it. And this is affective computing. Computing that can sense affect, can, can sense what the emotional level of the person interacting will be. For law, what we are already seeing is people using affective computing uh, for expert systems. So if you're doing something like an access to justice type system and you see that your um, the person doing it might be getting stressed, you might take them in one direction. If they're confused, you can take them into another direction. This is being added to these kinds of expert systems and there are some plans to do it already. Um, but there's also a kind of creepy factor about that which uh, we should be aware of in law schools and that's when it comes to distance learning because people are starting to come up with ways to add affective computing tools to distance learning. What's one of the problems with distance learning? You want to make sure people are paying attention. So they have tools that um, can see what your heart rate is and make sure you're paying attention that way or if your gaze is looking at the computer. I find that a little bit big brotherish, but it is part of affective computing and it's coming in the future. So uh, I think that's gonna be part of some of the different projects we're gonna be working on over the next few years. All right, and so the last uh, 
four to five year outlook, technology is robotics. This is a hard thing to squeeze into law schools. It's definitely gonna be something that's gonna be very important in other fields in higher ed. Um, and couldn't imagine a robot law school. Um, it'd be a great t-shirt to walk around in, that's for sure. Um, but how could robotics be used in law schools? Real stretch idea. But we could borrow again from medical education and develop um, client robots, the way that patient robots are being used in medical education, that have real pulses, that have um, real responses to stimuli, and a client robot could have a fact pattern programmed into him or her and be able to answer questions that the student is asking the client, um, give a variety of different